We have been addressing the essentials of Christmas and using as our text Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. If you need a Bible, hold your hand up. Our ushers will come around and give you one. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. And so, in our first sermon, we considered the first part of that. Behold, I have come. Proofs of his coming. Then last week we looked at, it is written of me. That was prophecies of his coming. And now today we're going to look at, to do your will, O God. And the purpose of his coming. And this will be in two parts, the purpose of his coming. Uh, This week we'll do part one, next week part two. Of course next week, Sunday morning, it's Sunday morning, Sunday morning Eve, Christmas Eve morning, (laughs) something like that. Then in the evening, of course, we'll have our Christmas Eve service. It it won't be part of this particular series. We'll just do a regular Christmas Eve service message. So that'll be a good time next Sunday evening. So make it Sunday morning, Sunday evening, you'll be blessed. So the question today is, what do most regular people seem to think that Christmas is all about. I don't mean the, the commercial aspect of Christmas, but what do people who value the authentic aspects of Christmas think it's all about? Those people who believe that Christmas is about the coming of Christ, what do they think was the purpose of his coming? What was the purpose of the coming of Christ? When people get all religious this time of year, what do they think the message is? But it seems to me that even those who uh, willingly accept that Jesus came and yet they are vaguely aware that there's something supernatural about his coming, yet the true purpose of his coming eludes them. What do most people feel the most essential message of Christmas is? Well, I'll tell you what I, I believe that over the years uh, people kind of think it's about peace on earth. That seems to be the great generic message that most people warm to at this time of year, peace on earth. You know, each year we try to go over to the Epcot there in Orlando to uh, attend that candlelight processional. And we have plans, hopefully, to be able to go this year. If you've never been, you ought to try to go. It's really something. It's very good. They have this wonderful orchestra. They have a lovely choir. And scriptures are read by uh, usually some well-known personality or TV person or whatever, or singer or somebody you might know. And then usually we stay around for the afterwards. They have the nightly firework display which is always particularly impressive. Usually, of course, they add, at this time of year, they add something to do with celebrating the festive season. I remember one time I saw the fireworks. Uh, They were tremendous, like I'd never seen before, and sort of a spectacular light show. And at the end of it, they, they brought the message of Christmas projected on a huge ball that, was sort of representing the earth. It had a you know, map of the earth on this big, huge sphere. And it had on it peace on earth. And that was the message. That, that is the most popular interpretation of what Christmas is all about. Peace on earth. And I would expect, bearing in mind the current conflicts in Israel and in the Ukraine, that the message will once again ring out peace on earth. Now, the inspiration for this most popular message does have its roots in the original Christmas message. It was the angel who came to the shepherds that declared, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward man. Peace, peace on earth. That's the message 
<laughs> that most people seem to think is the message of Christmas. So, but we ask, is that then the message of Jesus? Is that, is that the, you know, Jesus came to bring peace on earth? Is that, if so, he's failed miserably. There's no peace on earth, nor has there ever been since that first Christmas. This may be the message that the world hopes for at Christmas. And, and who would not want peace, really? Anybody in the right mind, who would not want peace? Well, someone, some of them. Some don't want peace. You don't need to remind you of the horrific events of the Hamas attack on Israel on October the 7th and the loss of life that followed in the present war. It's still going on even as we speak. But sadly, that's not the only conflict that's going on in the world. There is a web page called Global Conflict Tracker. You can track all the conflicts in the world. I counted it tracking at present time 26 conflicts and instabilities around the world. Peace on earth, yeah. I mean, we'd love for the, 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 the soldiers, the men and women, who, especially the ones out on front line, we'd love them to come home from the wars and there to be no more conflict. But it's naive to think that the true message of Christmas is a sentimental cry for the end to war. You know, I really miss hearing Elizabeth, Queen of England, give her uh, Christmas message. Uh, she did, used to do it every year. I'm not sure I want to hear King Charles. <laughs> Too woke. King woke Charles. In her last message, though, in 2021, I believe it was 2021, her last message, she spoke about family and children, and she spoke, of course, about the loss of a, people losing loved ones at Christmas because she'd lost her husband, Duke of Edinburgh. I mean, she said this, it is this simplicity of the Christmas story that make it so universally appealing. Simple happenings that formed the starting point of the life of Jesus, whose teachings have been handed down from generation to generation and have been the bedrock of my faith. His birth marked a new beginning, as the carol says, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Yeah, very nice. And, and you know, uh, I like the fact that she mentioned Jesus. And she would always do that. Sometimes her messages were a little bit more evangelistic or you know, stronger. But she would always mention Jesus. And that's an amazing thing these days because you don't expect a monarch or a head of state to actually talk about Jesus, the person's the center of Christmas. No, they usually use the celebration of his birth to further their own political agendas. Well, it's true that Jesus came to bring peace. But first of all, peace to the hearts of men and women. For that is actually where, according to the Bible, where war originates. James chapter 3, verse 18. Now the fruit of, the, of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desire for pleasure, that war in your members? So, as a noble a cause that it is to want world peace, the peace that Jesus came to bring is actually of greater significance. But it has to do, first of all, with peace with God. You know, there surely was no more, uh, no generation protesting for world peace any more than the generation that came of age in the 60s. And I was among them. And certainly we were sincere and very passionate about it. Protesting war and marching for peace and the rest of it. But you know, then, even before I came to Christ, I realized the war was within that that was the problem. 
that I wasn't at peace inside. The war was within. And with my neighbors or even your closest, you're still not really at peace with. And it's one thing to look at the world and point to all that's wrong in it and want peace, but it's quite something else to look inside and admit there's something wrong there. It's easy to look out and see that they need to stop the war and never face the problem of personal conflicts. Now, last week, was it? About nine or ten days ago, the 8th marked the 43rd anniversary of John Lennon's death. He was shot and killed by a crazed fan, Mark David Chapman, in front of his New York City apartment building there, the Dakota. And it was in 1980. Well, we've got some dedicated fans because even this year the fans continued the tradition of gathering around his memorial in Central Park's Strawberry Fields, they call it. Five-acre plot that Lennon frequented with his wife Yoko Ono. And it's dedicated to his memory. After his death, he called it an international garden of peace. I read an article and this fellow Ken Drummond, a fan who traveled from Wyoming for the event, said he made peace cool. Interestingly, a new song out. The Beatles had another number one hit. Two of them are dead. Now and Then, it's called. It was released recently amid controversy over using AI technology to raise John and George from the dead. <laughs> Remarkable what they can do. Well, in addition to the release of Now and Then, Apple TV aired a new documentary series just two days before the anniversary of the death of John. It was, it was titled, John Lennon, Murder Without a Trial. I watched some of it. And they showed John and Yoko Ono and their protests for peace, some old footage of them protesting, all the protesting that they did for peace. And I think he, he was very sincere, he, I couldn't fault John for that. I think he was very sincere, but I think he was also very naive. He even wrote a Christmas song. Not a bad song, but it really is another cry for peace. However, some stuff that people either forget or they don't remember or they never knew, that it's kind of ironic that after all their cries for peace, John went out on a several months long drunken binge with uh, some of his musician friends and Yoko kicked him out. <laughs> he kicked him out and he went off on this binge with well, Harry Nielsen and some other musicians. And uh, well, however, toward the end of his life, he did sober up. Give him that. He got back with Yoko and he did seem to find personal meaning in life at the birth of his son, Sean. But if he found peace at all, sadly, I'm not sure it was with the Prince of Peace. See, although all too often, those who lead the charge to change the world, stop the wars, can't even stay in a relationship without conflict themselves in their own relationships. Usually, for many of them, ended in divorce. And then they accuse Christians of being hypocrites. The Hollywood crowd, they're the most hypocritical people on the planet with their cry to end war, peace. And all war, worldwide cry for peace. And yet war rages on in their homes and in the divorce courts. Even Nelson Mandela, greatly respected for his efforts for peace in South Africa, his marriage ended in divorce. You know, he was arrested and jailed in 1963. He was in prison a long time and not released till 1990. And he separated from his wife in 1992. Seems they got on really well while ever he was in jail, in prison. <laughs> <laughs> they got divorced in 1996. He greatly respect the man, but couldn't, you know, peace for the nation, but can't have peace in your home. See, the true message of Christmas is not 
peace on earth, let's all get along for the holidays. No. The peace that Jesus came to give is much greater than that. And so that brings us to the true purpose of his coming. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. To do your will, O God. Jesus himself said, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus came to do the will of God the Father. That's the purpose of his coming. The will of God that is clearly laid out in John chapter 6. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day to give all those who will believe in Jesus everlasting life. But for this to be possible, Jesus had to be in absolute submission to the will of the Father. In absolute obedience. He said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written to me to do your will, O God. He chose to be in subjection. Made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, coming in the likeness of man, being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Stepped down from his throne in heaven to the manger. Relinquished his rights so he could be our savior. Emptied himself. What did he empty himself of? His deity? No. He was never divested of divine nature. He couldn't give up being God, but could become man. I don't remember where I read this description of the incarnation of Jesus, but I'd like to quote it for you. He who never began to be, but eternally existed, and who continued to be what he eternally was, began to be what he eternally was not. Like that. You see, what he gave up was his right to be expressed in all of his glory, to be revealed in all of his glory, to express his glory that is rightly his. That's what he gave up. And he was revealed in the form of a lowly servant of God. His whole life was an expression of obedience to God and serving God. At the end, giving up his life. You and me in obedience and submission to the Father. I don't understand how he could be totally man and totally God. I, I do know that's what the scriptures teach and, and so therefore it's what we believe. All man and all God. And this is an essential of Christmas that God became man. Emmanuel, God with us. It was the will of God. And it was for you and it was for me that he hung on Calvary's cross. Do you know, I don't have ever considered this. He could have disintegrated, dis blow up, <laughs> disintegrated the cross. Could have blew the wood up, just burned it, he just melted it, whatever it needed to do. With a thought. Have you ever considered he made the hill on which the cross stood? But he made himself of no reputation, gave up himself for you and for me. We all remember the Garden of Gethsemane where he struggled terribly at the prospect of bearing the sins of the world and experienced that bitter cup. He cried, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. If there are any other way, any other way for what? Any other way for men and women to be redeemed, to be saved from the terrible wrath of God? If there be any other way. But there was not. And as the Son of God agonized there, in, the Son of God agonized there in the garden, he was totally and completely obedient and submissive to the will of the Father. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, 
but the will of him who sent me. The will of him who sent me. I have come to do the will of him who sent me. Remember, he was sent. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All according to the plan of God, the counsel of God. Men in Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you take him by lawless hand and you've crucified and put to death, whom God raised up. Because having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible he should be held by it. And that which happened to Jesus was foreordained. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. You know, the fall of man did not take God by surprise. God does not get surprised. It's not like he had to readjust his plan, that that he'd purposed, because he didn't know what was going to happen. You know, sort of something unexpected came up. Now, just look at that. They're eating from the tree I told them not to eat. I just turned my back for five minutes. And there they are. No. And then some have represented the Lord Jesus as one who stands up for us before God the Father begging and pleading and finally persuading a vengeful God to save us. Let's never forget, Jesus was sent in accordance to the will of God the Father. He was sent. It's a false picture. It's false to picture Father God as being so against us that he needed to be persuaded by a compassionate son or a son's mother to forgive us and to save us. It's the Father's plan Isaiah 9, 6 begins with, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. A child is born. You know, there's nothing like the Christmas story, is there? The angel visiting Mary, telling her that she's going to have a son. And then her lovely song. She visits Elizabeth. We hear her song. Joseph and his, his dream. <laughs> they convinced him of the virgin birth. And they have Bethlehem. What a beautiful place Bethlehem was then, not now. No room for them at the inn. The angels appearing to the shepherds. The shepherds there going to the stable and peering into the manger. And then later on, the wise men showing up. I'd say that most people, even if they're not Christians, warm to that. Love that. Wonderful, wonderful story. But it is the second half of Isaiah 9, 6 that's so important. Unto us a son is given. This is the most important part. He was given. The only begotten son of God was given. Through the Old Testament, the father's plan is worked out as he prepared the world for the coming of his son. In the New Testament, we have seen the unveiling of the plan. And today, we see that work continuing on as the Holy Spirit convinces and convicts and brings men and women into the body of Christ as they confess Christ. And the purpose of God is carried on by the Spirit of God as he applies the finished work of Jesus Christ. He came to do the will of him who sent him. And what is the will of him who sent him? Well, first of all, let me tell you what it is not. What his will is not. And it's very plain to see it right there in Scripture. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. For the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, 
but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And what is the Father's desire? He desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4. So the will of the Father was to send Jesus Christ to be the Savior of the world and to die for everyone. As it says in the book of Hebrews, we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Everyone. I wonder if the will and the desire the heart of God is anywhere better expressed than in those mournful words of Jesus. As he, they were poured from a broken heart to Jesus as he wept over Jerusalem. And he cried, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing this is the heart of God. Is it not also the heart of God who longs to gather any here who will come unto him to gather him, them unto himself? It is the will of the Father that none perish, that he might gather lost men and women to himself. And there's a lovely verse in the book of Luke where he takes pleasure in giving you the kingdom. He says, do not fear, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Yeah, we, we learn and we know that we were created for God's pleasure, but it says here that his good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. That's what brings God pleasure, to give you the kingdom. So it's the Father's will for you to be saved and to enjoy him and his kingdom forever. I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. And did he do the will of the Father? Yes, he did. Though he cried, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he drank that cup, a bit of dregs. He went forth to the cross in obedience to the Father who desires to restore lost men and women into fellowship with himself by cancelling the debt of their sin. And the only way he could cancel the debt of their sin was by transferring it to Jesus. For he that the Father made him Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And the wrath and the judgment, the wrath of God and the judgment of God that we deserve was laid upon Jesus Christ. He bore our griefs, carried our sorrows. He's wounded for our transgressions. And the scripture says there that the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of, his all, of us all. And he went forth to that cruel Roman cross. For six hours he suffered terrible agony in intense pain, he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's my sin. Your sin was placed upon him. And he felt the full wrath of God. And being separated from his father as he died for us in obedience to the will of the father. You want to know the purpose of his coming? Consider these things this Christmas season. Consider these. He descended that we might ascend. He became poor that we might become rich. He was born that we might be born again. He became a servant that we might become sons. He had no home that we might have a home in heaven. He was hungry that we might be fed. He was thirsty that we might be satisfied. He was stripped that we might be clothed. He was forsaken that we might not be forsaken. He was bound, that we might go free. He was made sin, that we met, might be made righteous. He died, that we might live. He came down, that we might be caught up. Consider those things at Christmas. The children of a Christian school, they were 
all aglow, adorned in fuzzy mittens, red sweaters and bright snow caps upon their head. They're in, they were down front, sort of like down front as you say it would be here, as they getting ready for a, a song that they're going to sing. And, and they had these letters that they were going to hold up, a title of the song. As the class was going to sing it, they were going to reveal their letter. And the class would sing, and they would lift up the letter C for Christmas. And a child would hold up the letter C. Then they would sing H is for happy, and the child would hold up the H until each child holding up his portion and presented the complete message. They intended to present Christmas love. That was what the kids were holding the letters to, Christmas love. Well, the performance was going smoothly until suddenly a small, quiet girl in the front row holding up the letter M held it up upside down. Totally unaware that her letter M appeared as a W, the audience, first through sixth graders, that's what the audience was, snickered at this little girl's mistake. And she had no idea what they were laughing at, but she stood tall, proudly holding her W. Although teachers tried to shush the children, they were still giggling until the last letter was raised. Then they all saw it together and a hush came over the audience and the eyes began to widen in that instant and they all understood the reason they were there, why they celebrated the holiday in the first place, why even in all the chaos there was a purpose for our festivities. But when the last letter was held high, the message read loud and clear, Christ was love. Christ was love. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And some here, he may still be the child born in Bethlehem, laid in a manger. To many he is the son given, the government's on his shoulder, he's governing our lives. Who is it to you? Is he is sort of all of this, is it sort of like a, a nice romantic story for small children and old ladies at Christmas? Or is it the good news to set you free? <clears throat> Just a pleasant traditional story of the Christ child? Or a vital life-changing experience with the Son of God? The child, baby Jesus, or the sin-atoning Son of God? Surely, if the Father sent his only begotten Son to die for you upon a cross, it's really important for you to ask, is he my Savior? It's important for me to ask you, is he your Savior? Do you know him as your Lord and your Savior? How can you? Well, not by doing good works and giving money and going to church. Although they may be good things. Simply by putting your faith in Jesus Christ today and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Repenting of your sin. Turning away from those things you know to be wrong and turning your life over to God. Asking Christ to be your savior. If you've never done that, will you do that today? Let's pray together. While we're all quiet before the Lord, if there's any of you here that God has touched you today and you said, you know, I've never really given my life to Christ. You believe, and you, you even believe these things. You believe that he's the Savior. You just never asked him to be your Savior. Maybe you'd like to do that today. If so, just pray in your heart right now. Say, dear Lord God, I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me. I believe that you sent Jesus to die for me on the cross. and Thank you for that. I believe you raised him from the dead. And I invite you now, Lord, to be my Savior. To come into my life. 
and to help me live for you every day. In Jesus' name. Father, we do thank you again for sending your son to be our savior. Lord, help us to live for you every day and to give you glory for all that you've done and all that you've achieved on our behalf and all that you've offered unto us so graciously, so freely. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.